welcome everyone to our next uh, CTP colloquium. Uh, today we have Marek Tunski. Marek finished his PhD at the Jagiellonian University. Then he moved to Trento, to Italy, for two, three years of uh, postdoc. Yes, yes. And uh, then to Helsinki. And then he moved back to Poland, but, uh, well, apparently he preferred Warsaw over uh, Krakow. And he landed in- Very uh, unusual. Very unusual. <laughs> and he landed at the Warsaw University of Technology. Yes. He's uh, rising his Sonata project. And today he will give a talk about uh, ultra cold gases specifically about mixtures of fluids. So, Marek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Krzysiek, for this kind, kind introduction. And uh, I thank you all for uh, giving me this, um, this chance to speak to you today. I want to tell you about the mixtures of superfluids uh, in the context of quantum gases. And that's a subject that probably many of you know very well and probably better than I myself, but maybe some of you some of you don't, uh, so I prepared a um, solid introduction, as I was also instructed by Krzysiek uh, before the talk. Uh, but that's also a field where um, uh, where my research uh, has been uh, mostly, and that my current research topics are also in this field. So I will illustrate uh, later after the introduction. I will illustrate the subject with uh, with some results. Uh, um, and some uh, current research that I'm currently uh, uh, conducting. So let me start with uh, this uh, general observation that uh, we study physics uh, um, across many scales in terms of uh, in terms of many quantities, scale quantities, but also uh, among them temperature. So, for instance, the temperature of sun is very high; it's uh, more than a thousand uh, Kelvin. Our human experience is around 100, uh, of the order of uh, 100 Kelvins. Uh, now, when we speak about uh, superfluidity, uh, we uh, it always um, concerns low temperatures. That's an effect uh, that uh, is observed at low temperatures. So, if we decrease the temperature uh, down to around a few Kelvins, uh, then uh, there, there, there exists a system of uh, liquid helium where superfluidity was first um, observed. Um, uh, and that's about the same temperature as, as the microwave, uh, cosmic microwave background. So basically, that's, uh, that's very cold. However, if we want to study uh, quantum effects in uh, atomic gases, we have to go many, many orders of magnitude lower than that. Um, and <laughs> we have to go to very low temperatures uh, where uh, the quantum gases become degenerate, where quantum effects uh, can be observed. And that's, uh, that's about uh, something like maybe 10 to the 7 Kelvin. So that's uh, very cold. These are probably coldest places uh, that, we, that, we may, that we may start. And the systems themselves uh, to, to obtain a, a legendary quantum gas, that's a very uh, challenging, technically challenging, um, challenging task. Uh, in the picture here uh, to the right, you can see an example of a system that's just many lenses, uh, lasers, and so on. And that allows to trap atoms in a confined space and uh, to uh, lower um, and to cool them down to such low temperatures. And of course, those systems are isolated from the environment. As we learned, uh, uh, it was two, a week ago or two weeks ago uh, uh, at the colloquium of Professor Trotsky, we, we learned that actually there's a microchemical ensemble uh, that can describe such, um, such uh, systems. So the temperature that we speak about is, of course, understood as uh, in terms of average kinetic energy. Um, uh, if, if somebody would have any doubts. Okay, so let me uh, let me say that, um, of course, in at least in three dimensions, we have on the two options, we may have either fermions or volumes or atoms. So the bosons 
uh, if we speak about non-interacting systems, um, then we, we may imagine uh, bosons as uh, uh, fermions, well, uh, in both cases actually, occupying uh, single particle energy states. And uh, in case of in the case uh, of bosons, um, I just looking for later point. In the case of bosons, uh, the wave function has to be symmetric. So uh, if the if the um, temperature uh, gets lower, more and more bosons occupy the lowest energy states, and in particular the lowest one. And uh, if most of them, the microscopic amount of them occupies the lowest energy state, then the wave function is just the product of um, uh, single particle wave functions of that state. Uh, the system becomes a coherent uh, condensator, as we call it, a boson instead of condensate, uh, becomes coherent, and the entire system is described by such a wave function that uh, corresponds to this lowest energy state. Uh, in the case of fermions, the situation is very different, and that's because the wave function has to be anti symmetry. Uh, and that uh, has tremendous consequences also in terms of uh, tools and calculations that we have to do that will be completely different. Uh, uh, from those that we use for bosons. Um, so from the anti-symmetricity of the wave function um, stems a Pauli exclusion principle, which means that we have to determine the only single fermion at each energy level. So when the temperature is lower down to zero, we have to fill the energy levels one by one from the lowest one up uh, to when we uh, run out of fermions uh, and the that, that threshold is called the fermion energy. Um, so we already see that fermions are somehow more complicated because even though they don't interact, there is some, uh, um, they, are, they, they don't commute. <clears throat> now, if we include interactions with interactions in our system, uh, the whole picture uh, is, uh, is only uh, slightly modified. So we can imagine bosons. Uh, let's focus on bosons and condensation first on bosons. So bosons uh, lose the uh, so the temperature is being lower, and the De Broglie wavelength uh, related to, to the temperature uh, gets longer and longer, and uh, the, the 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 wavelengths that correspond to to particular atoms become, uh, start overlapping, and at some point um, they. Um, or a coherent, coherent object, uh, the condensate, uh, which I mentioned uh, the previous slide. So for <clears throat> ultra cold gases, bosons in condensate was obtained for the first time in, in 1995 uh, by two groups, by Eric Cornell and uh, Riemann uh, for the medium, uh, and also for potassium, uh, for uh, sodium, uh, excuse me, by Goldbank. Now, uh, if we want to have a, a general description of bosons in condensate, we have to revert to one something that is called the one body density matrix, which is defined here. And uh, mm -hmm. the presence of condensate and uh, this long range coherence uh, manifests itself in something in, in the property that is called uh, off diagonal and off diagonal long range order, uh, which basically means that it, it is uh, x minus x prime goes to infinity at long distances, this correlation. Is fine, does not uh, vanish. And then, if we perform a spectral decomposition of this matrix, one body density matrix in the thermodynamic limit, uh, if there is a condensate, then the eigenvalue that corresponds to the, con to the condensate is macroscopic, it does not vanish in the thermodynamic limit, and the corresponding wave function will be the wave function of the condensate. Um, Oh, yes, I plan to measure time and proceed. Okay. <laughs> so now let me. Uh, ah, yes. So now we want to uh, describe our compensate uh, more precisely. And this we can do to, uh, with um, uh, gross Pitevsky equation. So let me start with the gram fundamental many body Hamiltonian uh, for bosons, which is written up here. So, of course, we have this uh, interaction term. Uh, and that's uh, at the fundamental level, that's, that's Hamiltonian that covers the um, dynamics of a uh, system. Now, 
since we speak about the condensate uh, that's a coherent macros uh, macroscopic object, um, we can describe uh, that state of the condensate by a classical uh, wave function, which is which means that it's proportional to uh, to a unit operator plus some fluctuations. Now another simplification comes from the interaction that. Uh, Typically, is considered to be a contact a contact interaction, so it's a zero range interaction, and uh, the um, and also we neglect uh, we neglect um, uh, scattering of atoms with uh, with higher angular momentum, so we only retain the uh, S wave uh, interaction, uh, which is parameterized by the S wave scattering. Rate. So in the end, so um, mm -hmm. In the end, at, the, at this approximation, we obtain a simple, uh, simple functional for this uh, energy that is uh, quartic in, in this mean field five. Now, the, uh, if we minimize this, this uh, energy potential, this, this energy functional, we obtain the uh, equation of motion for the system uh, for this mean field, which is the celebrated cross test equation. And that the scattering length together with those. Um, Physical constant uh, with that combination of physical constant theory and now here it's called the coupling uh, coupling constant and the node mm -hmm. So now let me briefly discuss uh, a Fermi gas. <clears throat> that is uh, how how we incorporate interactions in a Fermi gas, uh, which is a completely different. Uh, we have we have a completely different picture of what happens. So for a uniform system at zero temperature, as I said, uh, fermions uh, fill um, fill the available states, uh, the, the lowest available states one by one. So uh, for a uniform system, that's these are uh, states of uh, well-defined momenta, and in the momentum space, we obtain a Fermi sphere. So all the fermions fermions will be inside <coughs> a sphere. Uh, excitations. Uh, small, small energy, low energy excitations will correspond to, uh, to a fermion that is close below but close to the Fermi surface, getting uh, enough energy to, to 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 get picked out out of the out of the ball, and uh, and we have the particle excitations above a Fermi a Fermi sphere. And the corresponding hole inside. So when we speak about uh, excitations differing gas, we we always speak about particle hole uh, excitations. Um, now, if we include the interactions and the interactions are weak, we might think that the situation becomes very complicated. But such Fermi liquid uh, can be uh, conveniently described uh, by uh, a picture that uh, comes from Landau. Uh, so we imagine that we switch on the interaction adiabatically, so there are no uh, energy level crossings and so on. The interaction is very, very, very weak. So there exists uh, there exists a set of quantum uh, numbers where basically the whole the structure of the energy levels will be the same as for the free as for the free gas. So again, we may speak about the Fermi sphere and the excitations. Uh, but this time we call them quasi particles and quasi holes uh, that, are, that correspond to excite elementary excitations of such an interactive. And we may also look at it um, from, from the perspective, from a different perspective. Then we can uh, um, think of quasi particles as a, as a result of Bogolubov um, transformation, canonical transformation on the, on the particle operators uh, that preserves. Uh, anti-commutation relations. Another important, very important ingredient in superfluidity uh, is spontaneous uh, is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so as you saw, the the um, the energy of the of, of the mean, of boson, mean field of bosons of the bosons to compensate. So the, the cross Pitesky theory would have a functional that is quartic in fields. Um, so uh, that corresponds basically to the uh, Landau's picture of uh, continuous phase transition. So we can 
expand our energy or uh, uh, beyond conductor and potential if we, we are not, uh, not at zero temperature up to the quartic term. And we can see that there, there are two possible uh, scenarios. So for temperatures that are greater than some critical temperature, we have uh, a thermodynamic potential that has a single uh, minimum um, at the, for the other parameter equal to zero, while for temperatures temperatures that are lower than, than the critical temperature, uh, there exists a whole manifold of uh, minima with finite uh, value of the of the parameter. So the actual physical realization of a system um, in an actual realization, we have to choose a certain value of the of the parameter. Uh, which amounts to breaking this spontaneous breaking the symmetry uh, and fixing the, in that case, the phase of the of the other parameter. Um, so, with this picture, with this scenario, we have uh, as we associate two, two types of excitations. So, if the excitations go along the gradient of this thermodynamic potential. We speak about uh, massive uh, Higgs excitations mm -hmm. and the excitations along this manifold, this degenerate manifold of, uh, of, uh, of uh, broken symmetry minima. Uh, excitations in that direction correspond to masses or gases, goldstone, goldstone modes. Uh, in the single case of the simple order parameter of a, of a mm -hmm. superfluid, we define it as something as a quantity that is proportional to the anomalous correlation function uh, between the these two different uh, fields that, that have the correspond to two different uh, spins. And in that case, the other parameters is a simple complex number. So the the this degeneracy manifold is just the circle that corresponds to the choice of the base. Of course, uh, from the BCS theory, with, with, about which I will speak uh, in, the next, in the next slide, we can compute the, the value of the phenomenon potential and we can expand it uh, and we can calculate the partitions uh, that correspond to this, to this uh, lambda free energy. So now the BCS theory that corresponds, that um, uh, describes the um, Fermi superfluid relies on the fact that for weak interactions, uh, fermions may form uh, Cooper pairs that at low temperatures may exhibit long off diagonal long range order. So now let me again start with this uh, general member body Hamiltonian. So here you see already that, uh, mm, that it gets simplified just by the fact that if we use, if we use the S-wave approximation, there is no interaction between particles of the same spin. Mm -hmm. So all the other interaction terms drop out, and we only have the interaction term between particles of opposite spin. Another uh, second approximation is, uh, is the same as previously. So we, we assume a contact, a contact interaction. Um, and if we if we uh, if we define our other parameter as I mentioned uh, already. As a as something proportional to the anomalous um, to the anomalous uh, correlation function that should be a coupling constant g from, then we can uh, then we can decouple uh, we can simplify the uh, this Hamiltonian uh, in such a way that we um, that it uh, that it's that it becomes quadratic <coughs> in in the in field operators. But at the expense of introducing a new field, which is the which is the uh, order parameter. So, in other words, we we obtain a mean field Hamiltonian that is quadratic in field operators. Um, at, at the expense of introducing a new field. So, if you want to be very fancy, you can say that that's, that's some, sometimes called the Hubbard's transformation. Uh, that that uh, for for um, Introducing the mean field. So if we now write the equations of minimize the right the equations of motion uh, for 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 the uh, Hamiltonian, we obtain the equation for the other parameter called the gap equation. 
uh, while gap I will explain um, in a moment, uh, which depends on this way functions u and v's, which in turn are eigen vectors of this uh, big matrix called Bogolubov vision uh, matrix. So in other words, we have this Bogolubov vision matrix, which we have to solve for the uh, energies of positive particles. And from the corresponding wave functions, we can compute the value of the order parameter, which we have to do self consistently. Um, and so we have to uh, solve those two equations self consistently. For a uniform system, the situation, the, 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 those equations can be solved, uh, can be solved um, uh, easily. So we see that the excitation spectrum has this form written down here. Uh, so you can see that. The other parameter delta actually plays the role of the gap of a gap in the energy spectrum. Now the situation is even more complicated. Uh, so if we are on the lattice, then uh, it's fine. But if we are in a continuous space in two or three dimensions, just because we introduce a contact interaction, we inherit uh, contact interaction, we inherit the the, the standard problem of uh, divergent integrals. So this delta. It's not well. It's not well defined. So we have to renormalize our theory, and at least in the context of ultra cold atoms, we do it in such a way that we want to keep the uh, scattering length fixed, the scattering length, which is a physical, physically well defined uh, um, quantity. If we keep it fixed, then we can produce a cut energy cutoff, uh, and uh, effective an effective coupling constant that depends on the energy cutoff in such a way. That they all that this equation is consistent. Now, because of this renormalization condition, uh, the effective coupling constant uh, remains finite throughout uh, the entire range of interactions. So we have a very interesting uh, picture here. We have uh, our interaction. Um, so here we have a, a, a plot. And on this uh, horizontal axis, we have one over scattering length. So you see that for weak attractive interactions, we have uh, our usual DCS theory. For a weak uh, repulsive interactions, instead, uh, the um, fermions, the, the Cooper pairs, become tight, tightly bound and form uh, molecules which subsequently form a composites and condensate. And for strong interactions, we have a very Peculiar uh, physical system called a unitary fermion gas that uh, where uh, interparticle distance is uh, comparable with this with the size of uh, average size of Cooper pairs. Um, so that's a very um, symmetric, uh, strongly interacting but symmetric uh, system. And for instance, the energy of such unitary fermion gas is proportional to the energy of free fermion gas. Uh, Scaled by, by a parameter which is called a Birch, uh, a Birch parameter. Um, now, the DCS theory gives uh, qualitatively very good results uh, when we describe the entire term gas, but for quantitative results, we need to include this strong, this energy coming from those strong interactions. So, we revert to density functional theory. So, just to make a long story short, uh, in the density functional theory, we simply say we simply uh, rely on constant theorem where, where, we, where we observe that the uh, wave function or the state of the system <laughs> is uniquely defined by its density for a many part for a many, uh, system of many particles. So, in other words, it's enough to have an, an energy functional that depends on densities and maybe also currents, and in our case, on the order parameter to compute all the observables. So there are probably many ways of constructing such functional, but the easiest choice is the local density approximation, in which we assume that this uh, functional is uh, local, spatially local, and uh, and, uh, and uh, we can we can express it as such as, as a as such integral. Now, so for the this standard BCS theory, such energy functional would be very easy. That would be just a sum of the kinetic energy term. So here, those tau's are kinetic energy contributions plus the term that corresponds to the um, to the um, to the order parameter. 
Now, if you want to, for the unitary thermal gas, you can generalize it, and this has been done by Fugard uh, some years ago, uh, where um, this uh, functional has this form where kinetic energies get modified by um, effective mass, and there is also this term that corresponds to, uh, to this interaction. And this, uh, the coefficients that, that would appear inside those, those expressions will, would have to be determined either from experiment or from up, uh, or from ab initial calculations. And that is called an asymmetric superfluid couple density um, approximation. All right, so uh, that was a brief introduction to the field of the fermions and bosons. So now let me illustrate uh, yeah. illustrate yeah. our calculations with some with some results. Uh, may I ask how much time do I have left? Uh, half an hour, not twenty minutes. Ah, all right. So I guess it's more or less, uh, more, or less yeah. more or less fine as well. Uh, well, so let me start with an, uh, so the um, implementation of what we call the general equations for the CS theory and for the entire Fermi gas. Was done in our group, and the results have been uh, uh, have been generated for uh, for some time for various problems. But let me illustrate, uh, for instance, a problem of collision of vortices of vortex lines. So it has been it was predicted um, for a gross test equation that the scaling of the distance between the colliding vortices as a function of the time to the collision should be should scale as a square root of that time and that scaling should be uh, universal should be in, independent on 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 uh, initial conditions and uh, details of the system so what we want to do in this work we wanted to, to test whether or not this um, relation generalizes for uh, Fermi superfluids uh, across the entire crossover. And that's what we did. So here you can see uh, a series of plots where I show, where I show the, the, the distance between the vortices as a, as a function of time to the collision event for uh, PCS, PCS for unitary Fermi gas. Uh, for condensate of um, for Bose-Einstein condensate of, of diverse for unpolar for uh, unpolarized gas and for polarized gas, and you can see that um, that uh, that that prediction that was done for uh, for Bose-Einstein condensate extends also for for third gases, so it's it's universal. So that's that's an example of uh, an application of uh, um, of the equations of fairness. It's a uniform system without a trap, yeah? It's, it's independent on, it's independent of, uh, of, uh, of the details of the boundary, condi boundary conditions and, and the initial conditions. So those simulations were done for a system in a box. Mm -hmm. So it's a local unit, mm -hmm. of course. But since the uh, collision, Event is very local, so the scaling is uh, is um, tested in the vicinity of the collision. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it does not depend uh, uh, on boundary conditions that are located far away. Um, sorry, I have just like a very high level question. So, so, so this is some numeric, so that's the of this DCS theory. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I see that you have sort of fitting power law. But you have just one or two scales at most, like orders of magnitude. Right? Uh, yes, so we are very, we are very, right? we are very limited. Well, we are very limited by by the since this, uh, as you saw, the, it requires a diagonalization of which matrix, which is, becomes very big in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, of course, we. Puts very uh, severe limitations on the on uh, how big uh, systems we can simulate in terms of spatial size. Uh, so yes, but this is something that we cannot overcome. In the, uh, okay, so this matrix is like a general dense matrix, not sparse, doesn't have any structure. But we need we need we need to have uh, we, we can 
it's not enough to have the lowest eigenvalue. We need to have many eigenvalues. Sure. We have mm. all of them up to up to the couple. Mm. So even if the, it's sparse, it does not have. Um, yes. Now we can our recent work on uh, Josephson effect. So Josephson effect is another example of an effect that's uh, paradigmatic for superfluids. And here we study. So in the Josephson effect, we study uh, two superfluids that are coupled that tunnel through a weak to a thin barrier, um, and we study the oscillations of the relative relative uh, part of the number, and also the, the, the corresponding phase, and we were particularly interested in the uh, dissipation mechanism. Um, and it turns out that for a, that there are different dissipation, there are different dominant dissipation mechanisms for PCS and unitary thermal gas. Uh, for um, unitary thermal gas, uh, the dissipation mostly happens through a generation of vortices, so phase slips at the barrier, whereas for PCS, uh, it's breaking of the pairs, and this can be seen down here in this plot, those plots. So down here you have the condensation energy that can be calculated uh, with the help of this integral, and you see that for the BCS it drops uh, with time. So uh, the amount of the number of copper pairs drops with, uh, during the evolution, whereas for the interior gas it stays more or less. Okay, so that was just an example. Uh, of calculations that you can can do for um, for thermal systems, but since my focus is on mixtures, uh, let me very briefly go through uh, mixtures of two Bose uh, of two Bose condensates. Uh, so again, you have your uh, full theory where you have now you have to include the interaction between the two two, two fields, the species, two 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 bosonic species. And again, this interaction can be assumed to be a compact interaction. And as a result, you get a Hamiltonian that is a very simple and uh, leads to two coupled cross plane equations. So, just, just very briefly, let me, let me uh, uh, say that the, basically the phase diagram can be very roughly determined uh, looking at the energy as a function of densities. So just by studying the stability of mechanical stability of this uh, system, we see that uh, at the mean field level, there are two possible phases uh, for uh, intercomponent coupling that is um, that is uh, small small enough. There may be a, there will be a coexistence of the two two components, uh, whereas for uh, for larger uh, if the component happens, there will be a collapse of phase separation. Now you can also, uh, if you include, you can uh, make the system richer by including, for instance, a term called Rabi coupling, which couples, coherently couples to the components. Um, and uh, and that, 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 that system is much, the dynamics become, becomes much more interesting. For instance, uh, here you see an example of a study where we started domain walls in the system, and those domain walls can break down uh, uh, if they, they become too long. May you please uh, explain what's the difference between coexistence and phase separation? Well, coexistence so separates the... also coexistence. Yeah, but they coexist in separate, in separate regions of space, uh, whereas coexistence means that they occupy the same space. So they are mixed. They overlap. They overlap. The species and in the phase case of in the case of phase separation, they they uh, they separate yes. spatial. Okay, uh, but the more more in, a more interesting uh, case application of or more interesting system which you can study uh, in the case of Bose body mixtures or binary boson synchronous if you will, are quantum droplets. So the droplet is a um, is a finite self-bound state that is characterized by a very high compressibility. So the energy as a function as a function of density has a well-defined minimum where the there is a preferred density uh, which minimizes the, the, the energy of the system. So if the system is finite, then 
it might be preferable for the system to stay self self confined. Um, yes. So now we um, in the in the uh, as was shown by Petrov uh, in 2015. If you consider uh, this binary condensate at very close to the threshold of the of this uh, mean field collapse, um, but already already at the site of the collapse, at the mean field level, the the system should collapse, but it may be stabilized by uh, including inclusion by inclusion. Uh, uh, by inclusion uh, the of the uh, beyond mean field quantum corrections, so these come in the form of Li Wang Yang correction, and they, this correction can be can be incorporated into the cross test equation, and it comes uh, in the form of the density to the power two halves. Now, since at the low energy level, uh, at the low energy level description. Uh, the, we can assume that the uh, densities of the two components are proportional to each other because the the, the excitations that, that would break this constraint uh, would require a higher energy, uh, higher relative energy. Then effectively we can describe the system with a single rescale. After rescaling, we can describe the system with a single single uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation that, that's extended by this V1 character. Uh, so, as I said, that was done by Petrov in 2015, uh, who predicted the existence of those droplets, calculated the spectrum, and um, it has many peculiar, many interesting features. And the, the droplets were also observed experimentally since then. Uh, I think the first person to do so for that, for that system was uh, the group of Leticia Tarwell. Uh, so, here you see an example, for instance, here on the right hand side, we have uh, a gas that is initially confined and then gets gets released and it expands with exception for the case for the parameters that correspond to this mm -hmm. droplet state where it remains confined without external trapping. And since then there were many other experiments mm -hmm. uh, that confirmed the existence of droplets. Mm -hmm. Also in the systems with bipolar interactions, mm -hmm. but it's a different different uh, So you can study, you can also study droplets, quantum droplets in one dimension. Here the situation is slightly different because the the one the correction is attractive and has a different power, uh, but the idea is basically the same. So here in that picture you see the energy as a function of density, uh, calculated <coughs> by uh, quantum Monte Carlo, that you see uh, that was from the work of Petro uh, uh, and you see that um, that indeed, uh, even at the um, at the initial level, you see that this energy that has a has a, a minimum for a specific value of density. So you can repeat the same procedures. You can define a single uh, after scale. You can, you can define a single uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation that describes the system in one dimension. Uh, and here the situation is, is, is very interesting because you uh, may study the system across the whole range of, of, of the mean field interaction uh, from the quantum droplet from the uh, quantum droplet state all the way to a bright solid one. So let me um, maybe illustrate it here. Um, for large Values of this delta G, that is this residual uh, mean field interaction, you will have this uh, quantum droplet state, which has, which even has a analytic formula. Uh, and when you when you decrease, you go to delta G equals zero, where you have uh, an integrable so solution uh, of this very peculiar soliton that corresponds to this uh, that corresponds to, uh, to an equation where you retain only this. Uh, quadratic term, all the way uh, down to uh, negative delta g and for large particle number, you have the usual 
usual dried soil one. So what, what we did in this work, we calculated the, the spectrum of the of the drop, the excitation spectrum of the droplet um, across the entire range of those interactions. And you see, uh, you can see that uh, uh, that actually uh, there is only a single uh, a single low the lowest ex lowest excitation survives to, throughout the entire range of interactions. Uh, and it's uh, monotonic and it asymptotically disappears uh, for, for uh, bright solid one, as it should. So that's very interesting, a very interesting result because this, this can serve you as a, um, as a measure, measurement way, as a way of measuring uh, the particle number or the, uh, where you are on this interaction, on this interaction spectrum. And whether or not you already have a bright, you're close to the bright solution solution or not. So this somehow characterizes uniquely character this lowest excited the frequency of the lowest excitation, uh, character uniquely characterizes the solution. All right. And the last uh, the last uh, the last uh, hmm, group of systems uh, correspond to uh, yet another. Uh, uh, mixture, which are both fermion mixtures. So here we, and this is something that I'm currently interested. Uh, um, um, in so you you so you can you can study uh, superfluid mixtures where you have both bosons, boson and fermion superfluid. So again, you have your two two um, two superfluids with their corresponding Hamiltonians, and again you have the interactions, which again you can assume to be contact interactions. Uh, both of heavy mixtures have been uh, experimentally were experimentally observed already uh, um, some year, many years ago, almost ten years ago. Mm, here, here is an example from from the group of uh, Christoph Stalemon, if I remember correctly, where they study. <clears throat> uh, Two, two oscillating clouds of bosons and fermions that are out of that oscillate out of phase and do it without dissipation for a very long time, which means that there is no dissipation and therefore uh, these are superfluid systems. Um, but such a mixture was certainly observed first in lithium by Randy Hewlett. In in, uh, in in the mixture of lithium. Uh, Yes, maybe I maybe I skipped that uh, information. So and then the Hewlett was the first one. Was it uh, long many years before? Or? Yes, oh, in right. the 90s. Yeah. So, um, so apologies for not including the, the experiment. Um, yes. So the the simulations, of course, uh, as since they include thermi thermi uh, thermi superfluid, they, they require uh, huge computational power. Uh, so in our group, we use uh, uh, big supercomputers. <clears throat> well, some of them we don't use anymore, but I just uh, put those figures as an example of of, uh, of big mm -hmm. supercomputers uh, to which we had access uh, in order to, uh, to calculate uh, to make our calculations. So we have access to Perumia supercomputers. You have access to these supercomputers in uh, Finland. Finland. Lumi. Lumi. Yes, there is a real yes. So let me show examples of problems that I'm currently working on. Uh, they are all uh, somehow in progress. Uh, um, uh, anyway, in one in one dimension, uh, let me first recall my other work where. Uh, you can study uh, solitons in the boson fermion mixtures. So here, for instance, we studied a uh, boson fermion mixture mm -hmm. and the solid and, and uh, for unit uh, for bosons interacting with the unitary fermion gas and for um, for certain interactions, if the interaction between the uh, yeah for certain for certain interactions, there was a regime where we could. Uh, um, where we could uh, say that our system has features and um, 
dark bright solid bond, uh, where there is a bright solid bond in both, in both the com component and a dark solid bond in the heavy component. And that's uh, and that's different than just bosons feeding in the the solid bond group of fermions. Um, so uh, so those systems are very very interesting. And now I study uh, in one dimension uh, we study um, other uh, solid bonds in the involuntary mixtures, but this time with polarization, for instance. So so there is. Uh, there is still uh, mm -hmm. interesting things that we do about. Another thing that uh, that an, an interesting uh, subject in the context of bosphoric mixtures are quantum droplets. So this the idea of quantum droplets in the bosphoric mixture was first introduced uh, uh, by people from actually uh, the Institute of Physics uh, here at, at uh, uh, College Academy of Sciences uh, in this paper and also. In, Another one, uh, but th what they did, they considered a free fan gas. So now you can consider a correction that uh, you can consider a, a fermion superfluid instead and believe that there hope, hope that there should also should be a, a droplet state. And this hope is supported by, by observing that you can calculate the pressure uh, with the correction that stems from the uh, from the BCS uh, interaction. And the droplet condition where the pressure is zero can be met uh, can be met along those lines on the density density diagram. So the in principle here we should be able to observe quantum droplets, but somehow the um, the results so far that the, my previous master student obtained. Uh, seems to be uh, somehow unstable, so this that still requires some work. Um, and now uh, I don't know how much time I have, but that's five minutes. Okay, that's perfect. That's actually perfect. But that's basically a last slide, uh, the last slide, and uh, and there is one one extra. So the for in two dimensions, you can also start interesting uh, effects. Uh, for instance, uh, an effect that I would like to start, that I am actually studying uh, now for two dimensional laboratory mixtures is an entrainment effect between the superfluids, sometimes called also Andrei Pashkin uh, effect. And this effect uh, extends the mean field the interaction between the superfluids to uh, include the interaction between the currents of, of, of the superfluid mixture. So the, this entrainment effect has been studied uh, already uh, a, few, a few times. Uh, uh, it was, for instance, studied for uh, in a hydrodynamic approach. Uh, it was also studied for a bosley fermi mixture, but using two coupled nonlinear Schrodinger equations. So basically, uh, fermions were also described by some modified test equation, um, and this this effect was uh, was observed. Was studied, was uh, numerically uh, observed in, in in such a mixture. <laughs> so now I'm working on, on this effect with my master student, Piotr Sotsky, who already managed to get a, a vortex solution for, for a thermal gas. So I hope that now we will be able to couple it to the, to the uh, gas of both the bosons and condensate and then see the entrainment effect. So that's basically that's basically it. Uh, insofar as uh, superfluid mixtures are concerned, uh, just uh, maybe last slide as a, as a, um, for the sake of self advertisement, I will just briefly mention uh, some research that I did uh, when I was in Finland on superfluids on lattices this time, where the physics is probably. Even richer than uh, on the U, because you may engineer your, your lattices uh, as you wish, practically. So we started multi band lattices, uh, but such lattices that have a flat band among the, in the spectrum. And in particular, we were interested in the phases in exotic superfluidity. So phases like through the Ferrell, Clark, Nocini, phase where uh, other parameter gets periodic modulation. Um, <clears throat> Um, due to present imbalance. So, for instance, we obtained, so here we, that, that's an example of a lead lattice. 
for which uh, we obtain the phase diagram uh, that features, apart from the usual VCS phase, it features a uh, few uh, different interesting superfluid phases, which we studied uh, in detail. And for instance, um, uh, for instance, uh, the FF, uh, for the FF, uh, F, uh, for the Ferrer phase, we could, we could uh, plot the uh, pairing correlations between different bounds and see that such uh, richness of the of the phase diagram uh, comes uh, from the fact that the pairing may occur not only within the same bound but between different bounds, and that introduces uh, that, that that introduces a lot of um, a lot of uh, richness to the to the system. So I thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, I hope that you find my okay. research interesting. Well, that's <laughs> Now we have time for a couple of questions. Who would like to start? Uh, I have a question for the uh, online audience. If you would like to start, then either raise your hand or just start talking. But I see that Lech, you wanted to ask. Yes. What is the greatest challenge in this kind of physics? Uh, it depends, it depends on your perspective. So if you if you speak about the so a lot of what uh, uh, a lot of what I was doing, and especially a lot of what I'm doing now in course of university technology, um, is done uh, through numerics, numerical simulations. And that's a big challenge because uh, even, especially for fermions, as I, sh um, as I, as I showed you, you have to di diagonalize those switch matrices. So you very quickly run out of uh, available memory and computational power. So if you want to really simulate three-dimensional large systems, uh, you have to uh, limit yourself to very coarse resolutions or very small systems. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's definitely a challenge. Um, uh, from 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 the okay, but this is technically and conceptually. Do you expect any breakthrough from this kind of computations? Breakthrough. Um, well, breakthrough has uh, can be how big breakthrough, breakthrough uh, would you would you would you expect? So of course that's not a fundamental physics. So uh, uh, it always it all resides within quantum mechanics. Perfect. So you may you may find uh, interesting effects, like for instance. This uh, 2015 result or, uh, or the discovery of quantum droplets was, in our field, very, a very, um, it could be called a breakthrough, breakthrough. But of course, it's certainly can, unexpected. Certainly unexpected, something that can be experimented. So, what's beautiful is that <coughs> if you find something uh, in, that you find interesting, there is immediate, very often, there is an immediate possibility of testing or, or falsifying this experiment. So this, um, the cold atom physics, and it's also some, some, discov some discoveries may, um, may be useful for improving uh, experimental uh, techniques also. So from that point of view, yes. But of course, this is not, uh, this will not change fundamental understanding of the physics if this is what you ask. Good questions. And so, can I follow up on this numerical uh, uh, because you're just the mm -hmm. computing of those properties? So, uh, you know, like in okay, I work in quantum computing, and then like very often people sort of expect that some problems are maybe hard to realize on cast uh, mm -hmm. uh, on Casca computers, but then when they stare at the problem long enough, they, they find some algorithmic tricks to, to have efficient classical solutions. Mm -hmm. right? So, right? so, so what, what are, like, in your approach, do you only have to diagonalize big matrices, or what, what, what exactly, what, what are the observables you're, you're interested in? What, like, what is, can you elaborate a bit on the structure of the problem? Yeah, so you know, basically, to answer, just to answer your, uh, just to relate to what, what you said in the, in the beginning of your, of your question. So if, if there are ways around, I mean, the, the ways around are the, <coughs> is to use maybe crude, in terms of, so I speak about fermions now. 
So when you when you consider terminals, if you want to avoid diagonalizing this big matrix, you have to uh, revert recourse to cruder approximations. Like for instance, as I said, uh, for instance, but can you recall what is, I don't want to dominate the terminal, no, but no, I, no. can you recall what was this big matrix? Ah yes, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I can go back to the matrix. It is somewhere here. Yes. So if look, uh, you have uh, a matrix that is uh, uh, that depends on on uh, sp uh, spatial coordinates, right? So if you have, so you have to put your system on a grid. And okay, so this is some uh, like in continuous space, and then you have to discretize. You have to discretize. So of course, if you have a symmetric system, if you already know that there is a cylindrical symmetry, for instance, then uh, then in principle this could uh, the equation could get simplified. But actually, the numerical cost of using the special <coughs> uh, uh, of using special function basis would be probably even larger than than than. Uh, than just using Fourier transform for uh, for Cartesian coordinates. So it, from that point of view, there is no way around. But of course, you may and that's what people typically do. That's what people typically do uh, is that very often do is that uh, instead of solving the Bogolyubov uh, division equations for fermions, they describe fermions also with the cross Pitaeus equation, just with some modification, some extra term. And this sometimes can get qualitatively well, good results, but of course, uh, we'll never be able to capture things like hair breaking, for instance, uh, because that assumes that you, or temperature effects, because uh, the, the, using gross test equation for fermions automatically assumes you have uh, that you just have your uh, superfluid order parameter and you cannot do. Um, that the only variables that you have is your superfluid order parameter. Mm -hmm. kind of <clears throat> so, yes, but that's, uh, but if you study bosons, for instance, then the computations are not, not mm -hmm. such a good problem. So, depends on, 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 on the system. So, that's what I stressed in the beginning that this difference <clears throat> between fermions and bosons extends also to calculation of tools. Uh, and that's why it makes two to, to atomic species so different in terms of. In terms of uh, simulations. Other questions from online audience, Daifu? No? Maybe I will ask the last question actually <coughs> related to the previous one. So for me to drop as well some kind of uh, breakthrough, I thought maybe the phase matter in the system mm -hmm. was well standard and still it was overlooked. But then uh, the physics of uh, atoms on the lattices, mm -hmm. which is strictly connected to uh, condensed matter. Then we are now in the uh, group which is working actually also on nuclear physics mm -hmm. for the probability. And there was the <coughs> questionable direction of merging this with astrophysics. And can you comment about what do you think is uh, about it? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure what you have in mind. The, what I like say you say is that, yes, so, but that's not what I work on. So mm -hmm. I will just tell you, I can comment on that, but. Uh, that's not where my research is. So it, also in our group, people work on uh, on uh, new, um, uh, neutron stars, where basically, which are, as the name suggests, are composed of fermions. So where you can, and there is also a superfluid, there are also superfluid effects. So you can study the same framework to, you can use the same frame, framework to study such systems. And that's of course uh, that's of course powerful uh, because it allows you to simulate something that you cannot experimentally test. That <coughs> your other, the, the experimental data are very very limited. Uh, so yes, in that terms, so as a technique, it can be used for. It can also be used for describing uh, nuclear uh, atomic nuclei. Uh, if there are there is superfluidity, you can use uh, boolean division equations for. Uh, and that's that's also what people do, and that's also what people do in my group. But uh, personally, myself, um, I stay on the uh, cold atomic side of, of, of things. Mm -hmm. But yes, that's true. That was a very good question. Thank you for it. You can you can use those those uh, you can use uh, these frameworks for nuclear systems and uh, and with success. I think we have finished. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>